to the races. How's everybody doing this morning? Yeah. Amen. It is great to see uh, you guys in God's house. I want to spend a little time uh, unpacking um, from, from the Word of God uh, the second part of uh, our, our, our study of the triumphant um, entry of God called, or the triumphant entry of Jesus uh, called The King is Here is what we've titled it. And I want to spend some time uh, just unpacking this a little bit more uh, from, from, uh, from God's word. God, th this, this text, we talked about it last week. Jesus is coming in on a donkey. And that means a lot. He, he isn't coming in declaring victory on a, on a chariot. He isn't coming in declaring victory on the back of war horse. He's actually coming in declaring victory on a donkey. And it's because, that, it's because when Jesus comes, he's not coming... Um, He's not coming, bringing victory through the normal passages that we would expect victory to come. He's not coming, bringing victory by, by slaying everyone in his, in his path as he comes. He's not coming, bringing victory by stumping on the neck of all the enemies as he comes. He's, he's coming, bringing victory by carrying a cross. And it's, and, it's, and it's that same pathway that he calls all men and all women to follow in order to see victory. He doesn't, call us to, he doesn't call us to seek victory by seeking the highest and most prominent places of power that we possibly can. He tells us to seek victory basically by following him and following his example all the way to the foot of the cross. To live life humbly, to live life lowly, to live life sacrificially, to live life not not grasping for as much power as we possibly can, but to live life in such a way in which we're sharing power in each and every opportunity that we can. Does that make sense? When the king arrives, he arrives in a way that no one in their right mind could have expected. He arrives, he arrives with a solution that no one in their right mind could have come up with. And so we want to talk a little bit more about this because, because he's continuing to unpack this solution for us in the text of following. In verse 27, he says, now is my soul troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. For this purpose, I have come to this hour. The king, the king comes to fall. The king comes to fall. The king is, Jesus Christ, in this moment troubled that he has come and, and, and he's come and he knows that his hour is near. He knows that his moment is here. And the Bible says that my soul is troubled. My soul is agitated. My soul is irritated. My soul is vexed with anxiety. Based on what? Based on what's in front of me, based on what I'm about to experience, based on what I'm about to encounter. Now, Matthew, Mark, and Luke record another moment where Jesus' soul is vexed, where Jesus' soul is troubled. And if you've ever uh, been in Bible study or Sunday school or you've read your Bible or you've heard enough preaching, you've probably heard this moment referred to. It was the moment where he was in the garden, the Garden of Gethsemane. The Bible says that his soul was troubled. His, 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 his soul was so troubled in that hour, in that moment, that literally the Bible says that he sweated drops of blood as he, con as he, as he contemplated what was in front of him, the task at hand. And now, again, we see that before we even get to the Garden of Gethsemane, in the moment of triumph triumphant entry, he is, his soul is troubled. In the moment where people are yelling, Hosanna, Hosanna to, the high, uh, Hosanna to the king, and they're laying palm branches at his feet, his soul is troubled. Because he knows that this victory doesn't come easy, right? He knows that this victory doesn't come with him riding in on a chariot or riding in on a war horse. He knows that this victory comes through the lowly trail. And so his soul is troubled. You say, well, what, 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 is this, what is going on? I thought he was God. He's God and man wrapped in flesh. And so now we see his humanity rising to the surface and saying, this is a hard weight that I must carry. Don't think about this weight as being simply a weight in which um, a, a, a man is going to a place of, of Roman torture, in, in other words, known as the cross. Don't think of it simply as bearing the cross. 
Because there's a lot of people that had to bear that weight. That's not why Jesus' soul is troubled. Jesus' soul is troubled is because he was going, not only bearing the weight of that cross, but he was bearing your weight. Jesus' soul is troubled is because he was bearing the weight of your sin as he went to the cross. Because on the cross, not only is the punishment from a physical dimension unleashed on the Son of God, but at the cross, the punishment of a spiritual dimension is unleashed on the Son of God. The weight and the penalty of sin is unleashed on the Son of God. The wrath of a righteous God is unleashed on his own Son. You say, what does hell feel like? What will hell feel like? What kind of punishment shall be endured in that place? What kind of torment? What kind of anguish shall be endured in that place? The Gospel of Luke describes a man who is in hell, and he says, can you just give me just a drop of water? Literally, literally, not, not a drop of water in the sense of, you know, how we talk about a drop of water where it really is about, you know, about half a cup. Hey, give me a drop of water, but it's like a half a cup. No, no, no. Can you literally give me a drop of water and put it on my tongue? It's a place of great anguish. The Bible says there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And so you say, what, what, what does this moment feel like for Jesus? What is he anticipating? He's anticipating that in this concentrated frame of our, or, or in this concentrated window of time, when he's on that cross, from the moment that he's hung to the moment that he dies, the wrath of God for all of man's and all of humanity's sin is unleashed on him in that moment. The penalty for your sin. That's why his soul is troubled. His soul is not troubled merely because nails go through his wrist. His soul is not troubled merely because nails go through his feet. His soul is not troubled merely because he gasps for air as he hangs on that cross up to six hours. It's not why his soul is troubled. His soul is troubled because he is carrying the weight and the burden of all of your trespasses and all of my trespasses. His soul is troubled because he loves you that much to carry that weight. And he says, what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. In other words, in other words, my soul is troubled. My soul is in anguish. So how should I respond? Should I respond by, by seeking refuge? Shall I respond by seeking rescue? Shall I respond by seeking relief? Shall I respond by seeking the exit door? Shall I respond by leaving and saying this weight is too much to bear? I love them, but I'm not sure I love them that much. Should I respond by saying, God, I, God the Father, I, I, my Father, I, I, I love your glory and I desire for you to be glorified, but, I, but I'm not sure that I desire your glory that much. How should I respond? Should I respond by saying, save me from this hour, free me from the burden and the anguish to come? He says, no, I won't respond that way. Instead, I'll respond this way, but for this purpose I have come to this hour. In other words, everything has led up to this moment. Everything that I've done, everything that I've said, everything, every work that I've worked, every miracle that I've performed, every healing that I have performed, every, every broken heart that I've mended, every tear that I've wiped, every dead person that I've raised to life, every single thing that I have done and accomplished has led to this moment right now here. I was doing all of it in order to get to this place. Are you tracking with that? That's when the purpose kicks in. So my soul is troubled, but I've been working all this time for this moment. No, no way I'm turning back now. That's when his divinity kicks in amongst his humanity, right? This is what you're here for. I'm not turning back. We're almost there. Everything has led up to this moment. Everything has been working towards this moment. And so the king comes to fall, but the king comes to fall in order that the king may rise. Do you understand that? Jesus sees that in this moment, yes, there will be a great falling. But in this moment, the falling leads to the uprising. Verse 28, Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd heard it. They said that it had thundered. Others said the angel has spoken to him. 
Jesus answered, this voice has come for your sake, not mine. In other words, you needed to hear it more than I did. I know that he's there. I know that he's there, and I know exactly what he's called me to do. I know what I'm here for, but you needed to hear that. And we'll see why in just a moment. Now is the judgment of this world. Now, now is the judgment of this world. Now will the ruler of this world be cast out. Before we get there, let's just talk a little bit about what came from heaven, the voice that came from heaven. Father, glorify your name. And the Father says, I have glorified it and I will glorify it again. What does he mean when he says, I have glorified it? Well, he means that Jesus Christ's incarnation was the first iteration of his glorifying his name. The Bible says in John chapter 1 that the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. When he came in the flesh, this was an opportunity for his name to be glorified. And from that moment all throughout, God the Father's name has been glorif being glorified through the Son's glory. For example, in John chapter 2, when the water was turned into wine, the Bible says that this was the first of the signs Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory. I have glorified it. John chapter 11, you remember and you recall just a few weeks ago as we talked about Lazarus, when Jesus was preparing to raise Lazarus from the grave, he told the sister of Lazarus what? Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believed you would see what? The glory of God, the incarnation of Christ. God the Father or God the Word made flesh was the manifestation of God the Father's first glory. But where does God's second glory come from? Well, it comes from the cross. And so like we talked about last week, normally when we associate glory with things, we're always associating it with high-minded things or victorious things or good things or happy things or joyful things. And so we see the glory in the birth of Jesus Christ. Hark the heralds, angels sing glory to the newborn king, right? We see glory in that. And we see glory in Jesus turning uh, vats and vats of water into, into, into vats and vats of wine. Everybody's like, glory. I'm sure the people at the party was like, glory. You know what I mean? Everybody sees glory in that, right? And we see glory in, in, in people being resurrected from the grave, being awoken or being awakened. Jesus walking into a young lady and saying, no, 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 folks. She's not dead. She's just sleeping. We see glory in that. But do we see glory in a crown of thorns? Do we see glory in being spit on? Do we see glory in being mocked and cursed? Do we see glory on the long stretch up to the Golgotha hill? Do we see glory when a man, an innocent man, wrapped up in an unjust system is laid, is slain, and killed. God says, God the Father says, that's exactly where my glory is. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. In other words, you can't skip to the resurrection to see God's glory. You must go through the shame of the crucifixion as well as the resurrection to see his glory. His glory is wrapped in all of that. Do you understand? You need to understand that because sometimes that's how our lives work. Does that make sense? Sometimes we want to get to the victory lap, right? <laughs> right? That's where the glory is for most of us. We're running, a 10, we're running a 10K marathon, and we're trying to get to the victory lap and, and say, glory, right? Glory, it's over. No, 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 no. There, there, there's, there's, a, there's nine and a half K left. There's a, lot, there's a lot of running in this race. And that's going to be hard, and, some, and sometimes it's not going to be pleasant, and sometimes it's not going to be happy, and sometimes there's not going to be a lot of energy in that. There's going to be a lot of moments where you're going to be sucking wind. Are you tracking? But the, it's the whole thing that's glorious. It's the whole thing that he's working out in this life called salvation, this salvific life, this salvation life that we're living. It's the whole thing. It's the highs and the lows. It's the, it's, 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 the, it's the wealth and it's the hang the phone up, right? Hang the phone up. 
<laughs> y'all, some of y'all don't know that. Some of y'all don't know that. Look, that's bill collector. <laughs> hang the phone up. I'm not. Nope. Hang the phone up. Are you tracking? It's, it's, it's the kids doing everything that you say, to, that you say do, right? It's the kids literally, literally you just thinking about things, and they're like, Mommy, Daddy, we decided to rise this morning because you are so pleasant and blessed to the Lord, and we want to bring you breakfast. It's like, oh, my goodness, this is wonderful. It's, it's that moment, and it's the moment where the kids are like, that's, that's it. That's all they got. It's this ugly look. You ask them to do something, they got nothing but this look on their face. Give you no words, no response, just. It's all of that. Do you understand that? And so when you look at your Savior and you see the path that he takes to glory, you understand that your life will take a similar trail to ultimate glorification in him. That you don't get a chance to skip those parts. Matter of fact, God, go, Jesus goes as far as saying, hey, if this happened to your teacher, how much more so? The students. Does that make sense? He says, now is this moment here. Now the judgment is here. So now he says a couple of things. In order for this glory, and in this glory, there's going to be a couple of things that happen. One, uh, the ruler of this world will be cast out. So Satan will be defeated through this moment of glory, through this effort of glory. Satan will be defeated. The ruler of this world will be cast out. Here's the interesting thing about Satan. He thinks that this is what he's supposed to be doing. He thinks in order to conquer the king, he must kill the king. And the reality is, is that in order for him, in, in, in order, in, rather, by conquering the king through death, quote unquote, he is setting up his own demise. And so the king will conquer Satan through his death. The king will save men and women through his death. The Bible says, it says in verse 33, I'm sorry, verse 32, and I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. When I am lifted up from the earth means that when I am lifted up on a wooden tree, on a cross, when I am lifted up, it is through that lifting, it is through that rising that all men and women will be drawn. In other words, salvation will come through that. Again, the king is falling in order that he may rise. And that we might rise in along with him. He said this to show by what kind of death he was going to die. So the crowd answered, we have heard from the law that the Christ remains forever. How can you say that the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? And so now you begin to see the struggle. We know that they're here. We know that the crowd has showed up because they have heard that this man, Jesus Christ, Son of God, has resurrected a dead man. So we know that everyone is here, that everyone is cheering and celebrating him because he has resurrected a dead man. But now, he, they're beginning to see sides of Jesus that they did not expect to come from a king. They figured, okay, if he's raised a dead man, then he's going to take Rome by the throat and set them in order, and he's going to put us back on the map. Israel, here we come, right? But now he says, no, 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 I'm about to die. And they're like, well, wait a second, what kind of king is this? I thought you was the son of God. What kind, what kind of Messiah is this? I thought, I, I thought you was the son of man, rather. What kind of, what kind of Messiah, what kind of Savior are we, are we looking at? This can't be a Savior. A Savior doesn't have to die. A Savior comes in rule. A savior comes and reigns. A savior comes and conquers. And they don't understand that he's doing every single one of those things by going to the cross. And so you begin to see the doubts creep in. You begin to see the doubts creep in. He says in verse 35, so Jesus said to you, uh, said to them, the light is among you for a little while longer. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness overtake you. The one who walks in the darkness does not know where he is going. While you have the light, believe in the light, that you may become sons of the light. When Jesus had said these things, he departed and hid himself from them. And so he says, whether you want to believe it or not, I am exactly who you've been waiting for. 
I am the light. You've been waiting for heroes, but those heroes aren't the light. Those heroes are darkness. Sometimes we get trapped in chasing heroes, right? We chase the biggest and the baddest, and we realize that they really can't lead us anywhere. Jesus himself says, listen, I know it doesn't appear that I am exactly who you thought I was, but I am exactly who you thought I was. Follow me, and in following me, you will become sons of the light. While you have the light, believe in the light. Trust in the light. So that you can become sons of the light. The reason why we call it, you know, a lot of times people say, um, you know, when they're trying to figure out what our church name is, they say, hey, you know, so where you got city light? You know, and then some people say city lights. And then other people say lights of the city. You know, other people say GE light bulbs. No, I mean, no, no, nobody goes that far. Nobody goes that far. But it's like, where is it? City lights, city lights. The reason we are city light and not lights is because we exist to shine the light of Christ. We believe that we are becoming part of the light as we connect to him, right? And that, yeah, we all have little lights that we're shining, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine, but, but we are connected to the light. Does that make sense? So we as a church aren't a light of our own. We are a light that must have the light in order to illuminate. Does that make sense? And that's what Jesus is saying here is that, yes, when you trust and believe in me, then you, instead of being in darkness with no illumination, you will become light. But this is where we get into the unbelief. They say in verse 37, look with me there. Though he had done so many signs before them, they still did not believe in him. And so Jesus leaves them. This is, this is Jesus wrapping up his public ministry, and so he's leaving. From here, he dedicates the, uh, dedicates the rest of his time teaching and loving and preparing his disciples for his departure. As Jesus steps away, though, he leaves us to make sense of what kind of impression he has left with these people. So Jesus is gone, and now they're just kind of taking all of these things in that they've received. Though he had done many signs before them, verse 37, still they did not believe in him. The only thing worse than believing merely because of signs is not believing in the presence of signs. They have everything they need to believe on Jesus, and yet they do not believe, they do not trust. Gospel belief is a two-way street. In other words, what I mean by that is that we, we, we learn that just because people have an opportunity to witness great works doesn't mean that they will believe. There can be tremendous works performed in front of people, and they still will not believe. We'll, we'll, we'll unpack a, few, a reason or two before we leave in just a moment. But Jesus has spent approximately three years teaching preaching, performing signs, performing miracles. He has spent more than three years declaring that the kingdom of God is at hand. And while healing all manner of diseases, producing something from nothing, like when he took the lunchbox of fish and bread and, and made a miracle buffet feast for thousands of people, raising people from the dead, turning water into wine, and yet, as his public ministry closes, and they're collecting all of this in their mind, they're thinking about all these things as they have happened, there are still people who will not believe. And don't you for a second say, well, that wouldn't have been me if I was there, because if I would have saw all that, I would have believed immediately. No, 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 no. Don't trick yourself into believing that that's how your heart operates, because it's not. When we want what we want, we will always find reasons to deny what is right there staring right in front of us. Does that make sense? This is a warning not only to, to, to the idea that people can see it and still not believe it, but this is a warning to us not to pursue pragmatics 
when we're thinking about how to do ministry. And what I mean by that is that don't let the results drive the methods. See, if Jesus' methods can't guarantee belief among the crowds, then certainly ours can't. Are you tracking? If Jesus can't guarantee belief, then we can't guarantee belief. And, and, and so we must prepare our presentation of the gospel well. Listen, don't be lazy in how you think about sharing the gospel. Don't be lazy in how we think about doing church. I'm not arguing for that. We must share the gospel with every single person that we ever run in contact with and, be, and share it freely and share it richly with those around us. But we must also entrust the work of the gospel to God and to God completely. And so, yes, we should do things well, and we should do things with excellence. And yes, we should share the gospel with people, and we should communicate our faith as often as we get the opportunity. But we must entrust what God does with it to God himself and not us. We can't start manipulating the results. Does that make sense? Regardless of the numbers that come with the result, we can't start manipulating the result. We can't start saying, hey, we're going to do a baptism from a, a fire truck and we're going to bring clowns in and we're going to do a baptism from a fire truck and the clowns are going to be the, bap the baptizers. Everybody come on. And then we get like thousands of kids that come and get baptized and we say, look at how many people God saved. We can't start manipulating the results. Does that make sense? Which, by the way, that actually happened. I'm not making that one up. That actually happened. Jesus doesn't share his good news because he knew people would believe every single time. He shares it first and foremost because he is seeking to please the Father. Remember, he says that my food is to do the will of my Father who is in heaven. So that's the first thing that you have to think about. But the second thing that you have to think about is that Jesus is concentrating on the long game, not the short game. In other words, there will be some people that fall away. There will be some people that do not accept. There will be some people that do not believe. But Jesus knows how this all turns out. And so he's not worried about changing and tw twisting up methods, and neither should we. Nine Marks talks about the, uh, Nine Marks website, which is a, uh, a website about churches uh, doing church well. It talks about three ways that sometimes we slide off into pragmatism. It says that we... People were arguing more for, from the results versus from the scripture. In other words, we look at the results and we say, well, hey, we got 100 people saved this way, or we got 100 people to come to church this way, or we got 200 people to come to church this way, and so therefore, let's just keep doing it that way, rather than saying, is what we're doing even biblical? Is what we're saying biblical? Is what we're preaching biblical? Or are we just saying whatever, whatever we can say to get as many people in the room as we can? It said another way that people do it is that they evaluate the numbers more than their faithfulness. They say, well, how are we doing? And then they see, wait a second, wait a second, we lost two people. What do we need to do to get them back? Or we say, oh, man, we, we, gained, we gained 20 people, so, what do, we, so what, do we, what do we do to gain those 20? Let's keep doing that. Instead of saying, are we faithful to the words of God? Jesus seems to be totally uninterested in that. He says, going about his life, listen, my food is to do the will of the Father who sent me. That's what I've been called to do. There will be some, there will be many that come. There will be some that fall off. There will be many that fall off at times. But my will is to do the will of the one who sent me. Jesus' goal is faithfulness, 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 and then fruitfulness. Faithfulness is what we drive towards. Not everyone will accept the reality of a crucified king as we see here. Not everyone's going to accept it. Some people will say, that's too much for me. I'm not feeling that. Not everyone will accept the crucified call. In other words, the call to come and walk with this king the same way he walked. Some people will say, that's too much for me. I'm not embracing that. But that is the message, and we must share that message faithfully. Share it well, right? Right? Share it freely, but share it faithfully. In fact, let me say this too. That leads me to another caveat. I'm not anti-big church, okay? Number one, we got some faithful churches in America that, that are serving the Lord and that are giving their, giving their lives to love and devotion of God, love and devotion to God and love and devotion to neighbor, okay? 
and they are doing it well, serving their communities well, preaching the gospel well, and God is creating flourishing amongst them and adding to their number. The Bible says in Acts chapter 2, after the first sermon of the church, the first sermon of the early church in Acts chapter 2, the Bible says 3,000 people were added that day. I'm not, against, I'm not against big church, otherwise I'd be against the Acts church. Are you tracking with that? And my prayer, and my prayer is in this room that, that by the time we look at 10 years, I don't know if we'll even be here, but if we were here, every seat in this room would be filled. From the top to the bottom, I'm praying that souls would come and that they would, and that they would, and that the souls that are being fed in here, that, that are hearing the word of God, I pray, that are hearing the word of God, are responding to the word of God by faith, and then going out and making other disciples and sharing the word of God. That's what I'm praying. And that's what I hope you would pray. So I'm not, I'm not, I'm not saying that we're anti-big church at all. If God adds to our number and, and, and lines up 300 faithful, diligent soldiers of the cross ready to go and shine light through e in every single dark space in this community, I would sign up for it today. I'm all for it. Ready to see it. Can't wait to see it. I'm just saying we need to be faithful first. Let's be faithful before we be fruitful. Because if we be fruitful and then we say, well, faithfulness just comes whenever it comes, and that means we'll start twisting up the sermons and say, oh, well, let's leave that part out because people aren't like that part. So let's just leave that part out. You tracking with that? Even with the knowledge of knowing not everyone will believe, our ambition for the gospel should not change. We should still carry gospel ambition. We still should be saying, okay, everyone's not going to believe, but that doesn't mean I stop sharing Jesus said, right after he said, my food is to do the will of the Father who sent me, he said, listen, do not say there are four months, then comes the harvest. Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest. Already the one who reaps is receiving wages and gathering fruit for eternal life, so that sower and reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you did not labor. Others have labored, and you have entered into their labor. In other words, he said, don't say that the harvest is down the road, that, we'll, that it's ready. It'll be ready in a couple of years. It'll be ready in five years. It'll be ready in six years. He says, no, the harvest is ready now. Go out and make my name known. Go out and share my glorious gospel, my good news with the world, with your neighbor, with your friends, with your coworker. The harvest is ready right now. And so that is gospel ambition, but it must be gospel ambition fueled with gospel faithfulness. And if gospel ambition is fueled with gospel faithfulness, then the gospel fruit that comes from it will last. And that's what we're looking for. Amen. But he also says in verse 39 that they could not believe. So they stopped believing. They weren't believing, but they could not believe. In other words, there was a sort of judicial blindness, as some of the theologians call it. Because they kept rejecting, eventually God turned their hearts over to complete and total blindness. Charles Spurgeon says, if men can see and yet will not see, God is at last so provoked by their wick wickedness that he takes away the light altogether and removes from them the very faculty of sight. It is not surprising that it should be so, for it was so with the generation in which Christ lived. They had so long rejected the true prophets, so long refused to listen to the voice of God, that at last he abandoned them to their own ways. And nothing worse can happen to a man than to be abandoned of God. If God cast thee off, Thou art lost indeed. It says in verse 40, he blind, uh, for again, Isaiah said, chapter 12, verse 44, he has blinded their eyes and hardened their heart, lest they see with their eyes and understand with their heart and turn, and I would heal them. He's blinded them because they were so committed to not seeing. We see it through the New Testament. We see it in 2 Thessalonians where God says he will send a strong delusion because they did not love the truth. You hear that? Because they did not love the truth, he will send them a stronger false truth. Does that make sense? 
because they kept embracing false truth, he'll send them something even stronger than the false truth they already embraced. And so we see this happening with this group is that their heart is turning further and further and further inward on themselves because they have chosen to reject the truth that is literally standing before them. Now, it's never pitted against human responsibility. They have responsibility, even though while God is sovereign, and this is when we get into the mystery of unbelief, because they have responsibility, they have culpability, even while God is sovereign and saying, okay, if you don't believe, I'm going to harden it even more. But somehow, in some way, in God's divine mystery, he's working out his sovereign hardening and this human responsibility to respond. And then lastly, verse 42, verse 42 through 43. Nevertheless, many, even of the authorities, believed in him, but for fear of the Pharisees, they did not confess it, so that they would not be put out of the synagogues. For they love the glory that comes from man more than the glory that comes from God. So they did not believe, right? They could not believe in order to fulfill the prophecy of Isaiah. But they also loved not to believe. You say, well, where where does that love not to believe come from? Well, did you read it in verse 43? They love the glory that comes from man more than the glory that comes from God. And so you have a group of people amongst them. Some of these people, they saw the signs and they say, I don't believe him. I, I can't trust him. I don't think he's the one because he's talking about he has to die. I'm not, I'm not accepting that. I'm not embracing that. There are others who are saying, but he did raise Lazarus from the grave. And I heard that he turned water into wine. And I heard that he raised a young lady from the grave. And I heard there was a woman who touched the bottom of his garment, the bottom of his robe, and was healed. And so I don't know about what y'all are saying, but man, this, this guy seems like the real deal. He seems like the one. He seems like, he seems legit. But what will everybody else say if I start following him? What will everyone else say if I walk with them? And so it's not that they don't know the truth. It's that they don't love it more than they love the rest, more than they love the glory of man. What we see in this text, in this, in this end, in this closing piece, is that genuine saving faith is more than just a matter of mental inclination. It's more than just a head thing. It's a matter of love. Trusting Christ has just as much to do with loving him more than the rest. Do you understand? They did not love the glory of God more than they love the glory of men. And so their trust never came around. Do you understand? They feared. You, you, see how fear, you see how fear is driven by love? Think about that. They feared the authorities. They feared, or rather many of the authorities believed in him, but they feared the Pharisees. Well, why do they fear them? They feared them because they loved their glory. They feared them because they loved their approval. They feared them because they loved their pats on the back. You understand how fear drives this, right? And so when we ask ourselves, why is, it that, why is it that I'm so scared sometimes to share the gospel, right? Why is it that sometimes I'm so scared to, 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 to speak God's word to people? I'll tell you why I am a lot sometimes. It's because I fear their validation. It's because I fear their approval. I fear that if I share that with them, they'll reject me. You tracking with that? I fear if I make God known in this window, the people that's in this window will forsake me. And I don't want, I don't want them to. I want to keep them around as long as I can. Why do we put our lamps under bushels? Because we fear what people might say if we let them shine. And this is what's happening here. They fear man. 
because they love the glory of man. And so because of that, they literally reject the Savior of the world. They love that glory so much that they will not trust in the Savior of the world in order that they might keep the glory of man. How deceptive is the glory of man? Convinces us that we actually have something, don't it? doesn't it? We forsake eternal life. We forsake the salvation that comes from one and one only. We forsake the God of the universe in order to keep the glory of man. How deceptive is the glory of man that it presents itself as being so prominent when it's so fleeting. Presents itself as being, as being so high when it's really so low and so limited. It can't satisfy. It can't sustain. It can't keep you. It can't, most importantly, save you. Why do you forsake the glory of God for such a frivolous and useless glory that comes from man? Leave the glory of man so that you might trust in this Savior for his glory. Step out. Make the declaration that you are walking with Jesus Christ, that you have heard the facts and that you believe them, but you haven't stopped there. Now you're trusting him following him, dying to yourself, walking with him. That's what he did for you, amen? He died for you. Now, go out for his glory and make his name known. Amen? Let's pray. God, we love you and thank you and appreciate you. Would you continue to make yourself known amongst us? Would you continue to help us Help us, Lord God, forsake the glory of man in order that we might fully and completely, Lord God, submit ourselves to you. We thank you, Lord, that in our failure to do so, that the Savior, Lord God, he covers us in our sin. That in those moments of doubts, even for the believers that have trusted you with their lives, the moments of doubts that we have, the moments of fear that creep up, Lord God, as we seek to gain the approval of the people around us, Lord God, we pray that you would help us with that, cleanse us, of, uh, forgive us of that, Lord God, strengthen us against that. And Father, we pray that you would help us, Lord God, seek the glory that goes to you, the glory that comes the lowly, the lowly routes, Lord God. Because it is in those routes, Lord God, in which your name will be magnified. And when it is all said and done, we'll see this thing to an end, to the expected end, Lord God. We'll see the chariots. We'll see the horses. We'll see the second triumphant entry. But Lord God, help us. Help us walk out and live out the first as you did for us, Lord. We love you. We thank you. We give you all the praise, glory, and honor in Jesus' name.